please welcome Heather Tallis. Hello, good morning. Thank you all for coming. I'm Heather Tallis. I'm a lead scientist with the Nature Conservancy, where I work on the human dimensions of conservation. You've heard a lot about that already this morning. And what it means there is that I work across our programs around the world to bring economics and social sciences more into the work of conservation. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, some of the emerging science that suggests we might need to think about nature a little differently than we do now. So most of you are here because you do think about nature, which isn't necessarily common with everyone. And when we do think about nature, we might think about it as regal, dizzyingly diverse, bold or triumphant, vicious, vast and expansive, or awesome in the real sense of the term. This is a jellyfish that was caught on video for the first time last year in my backyard in Monterey Bay. The bell of that jellyfish is six feet across, and the tentacles are drapes of tissue, just an incredible being that we didn't even know existed less than a mile offshore in California. We might even think about nature as inspiring or divine. What we don't do is think about nature as normal or everyday. We don't usually think about it when we turn on the tap. We don't think about it when we send our kids to school. We don't think about it when we open the refrigerator or invest our retirement funds or sit down at a desk to do our work. And increasingly, there's science that shows that we should in every one of these cases because there's a real and measurable effect of nature on a lot of the parts of our daily life that we don't commonly think about. I'm going to talk about just two of those today to give you an idea of what the science is showing and what I mean when we talk about thinking about changing the way we think about nature in our daily lives. The first one I'll talk about is nature as a water filter. This will be more familiar to some of you, um, but increasingly popular as a real action we can take um, that changes the way we invest in nature and bring it into our cities. As I'm sure all of you know, water falls pretty much everywhere in the world now as clean, drinkable water. But then it goes through what I like to think of as the gauntlet of a watershed. In most cases, that water flows across developed areas, farmlands where it picks up chemicals and pesticides or other kinds of pollutants, ranch lands where it may pick up um, things from livestock, eroded areas where it picks up sediment, and then through cities and paved areas where it picks up more pollution. By the time water gets to most of the places we want to use it, we have to pay a lot of money to clean it up. So the system we have now today uses our investments in built infrastructure, in water treatment facilities, in water um, distribution centers that clean that water to a state where we can use it. But there is another way to do this, and that model is taking off in Latin America and increasingly in the United States. In Latin America, it's called water funds. And there, people who live in valleys and major population centers are voluntarily investing in watersheds and keeping water clean at the source. So instead of putting all of our money into built filtration plants, some of that money is going into um, keeping watersheds in better shape, uh, training farmers and ranchers to use better management practices that lead to less pollution, restoring riparian areas that act as water filters, protecting existing native areas where they are so they act as sponges and filters themselves. What's really fascinating is that this is taking off in a voluntary way across Latin America. There's now over 30 major cities that have voluntarily, again, created water funds. And these range from Mexico City to Sao Paulo in Brazil to Medellin in Colombia. These are not small efforts. These are major water infrastructure investments. And while this is taking off as an idea, um, I want you to see a little bit of the diversity of, of partners that are already involved. There's a lot of public sector investing happening from municipal groups on both a small and a national scale. There's investments from um, international aid organizations and multilateral lenders. And on the private side, there are, again, people choosing to spend some of their corporate funds on their water supplies in the belief that it will benefit their bottom line in the end. So we have everyone from Saab Miller to Coca-Cola bottling companies who need that water for their products. We have hydropower companies. And we have foundations of some companies that are looking at this as a way to be a bottom line improvement in the future. But with all this excitement, there hasn't been a lot of science behind making sure we get those returns. So for about the first five years of these investments, funds were given to whoever would participate in the watersheds as a way to get things started. 
And then I started working with the Natural Capital Project based at Stanford and with the Nature Conservancy to develop a science-based way to make these investments more robust. So we developed a tool called RIOS that brings to get together social science about who's willing to work in the watersheds with uh, economic information about the costs of projects and ecological information about where projects are likely to have the biggest benefits. And what you see here is a result of that tool. It can produce these investment maps that give us a sense of how to balance the investments in different projects for a given budget. This is really important because these projects can be huge. This is 11 watersheds across over 250 miles for one city, Cali, Colombia, where they're investing millions of dollars a year. We looked at whether or not these increasing investments can uh, give additional benefits. So this is a classic return curve where we're looking at pollution reduction as you increase a budget. And so companies can start to see whether or not and how their increasing investments will give additional gains. And obviously doing this takes more time and more money than the old version of just giving out funds. And so we wanted to know how this approach compares. So this bottom line here is the business as usual investing approach. And you can see basically that using this scientific method can give us up to a six-fold better return on investment in some of these watersheds. So obviously worth the time. In putting this talk together, I learned there are obviously a lot of efforts already in the United States that are bringing this approach to bear, and some of them are in Colorado already. Denver Water has a big relationship with the U.S. Forest Service, investing in forest thinning practices and other forestry management to improve Denver's water supply. And there's a new initiative called the Colorado Conservation Exchange up near Fort Collins that has a long list of, of stakeholders and investors that are bringing uh, cleaner water through environmental management to those cities as well. So there's a lot of potential here for this approach to grow and expand and give us a really different way to think about nature in our daily lives and, and for um, investments in Colorado to bring nature into the cities through our water. I'm going to shift now to a pretty different opportunity and a little farther afield from what we are used to thinking about when we think about nature. And that's thinking about nature as part of education. We've heard a lot about nature-based education and nature-based play and all that we've learned recently about how critical that is for youth. I'm going to talk about something really different. When we usually think about nature education, we're thinking about the outdoors, getting kids outside and getting them more engaged with their environment. When we get into the classroom, we usually stop thinking about nature. And we think about other things that we know are important for the learning environment. Things like poverty, classroom size, school funding, all the things you're used to hearing political debates about, and that we're used to spending billions of dollars on to help improve education. Nature is not on this list almost ever, and there's starting to be indications that it should be, even inside the classroom. So we're really lucky today you're all probably a little smarter just sitting here because there is research that shows that adults exposed to even short visits outside have improved cognitive function. They do better on simple math tests. They recall information better. So your view here today, just sitting inside, is potentially making you smarter. So thank you, Davida, for that. There is increasingly some evidence from children. Most of this research so far has been done in adults. But there have been some opportunities to learn from housing situations. There was a great study that followed a cohort of children who moved from uh, housing complexes that had very built, a lot of city around them, to more greener housing, and compared them to children who didn't move. And those who went to greener surroundings um, were better able to focus their attention and to recall information. These are two traits you should recognize as commonly lacking in ADHD and in a lot of our learning problems in schools. So this suggests that these kinds of benefits, if they exist in schools, could help students learn. And now, finally, there have been a couple of studies in schools. The largest one was in Georgia, looking at 71 schools of fifth graders. And they found a strong positive correlation between greener views and fifth grade test performance. So this starts to suggest that even inside the classroom, there's a connection between your ability to learn and what you see outside and whether or not that's natural. So I'm really interested in this as a possible you know, major conservation strategy and a major opportunity for us to think really differently about how nature matters for education. So we started a study last year that's looking more broadly across five states in the US to ask if this is a widespread pattern, if we see these trends at a major scale. And we're just finishing a pilot in California now. These states have the five fastest growing cities in the country, so have the biggest opportunities to build new schools in the coming years and design those schools in potentially different ways. 
In this study, we wanted to ask another question, which is that often in these studies, um, we're really vague about what green is. A greener view could literally be the color green. Or it could be a more natural area that's not green, like a desert. Or it could be a very structured view that has trees and shrubs that interrupt our attention and in some way benefit thinking. But these mechanisms aren't really looked at closely in the work so far, and we want to know, is this a conservation issue? If we plant native trees outside schools, is that better? Or can we just have cornfields? Both of these are obviously beneficial for education. Who knew a greener cornfield could help kids learn? But from a conservation perspective, we really need to know, is it nature that's helping kids or not? So we've looked at these three factors around 500 schools across California. This is the biggest study to date. There's 6,000 elementary schools in California. I remind you that it's the sixth largest economy in the world, so we're basically studying a nation state in terms of the population and the diversity of socioeconomic um, conditions that are there. So we've, we've sampled these schools, importantly, across these other things that we know matter. So we're asking if, in addition to poverty and classroom size and level of funding in the schools, nature adds to learning inside the school environment. And I have only preliminary results right now. We're finalizing the study this month. And all I can tell you is that the initial indications are mind-blowing. <laughs> so without saying any more, um, I just want to encourage us to continue to think about nature in cities as an affordable and reliable way to improve education as a question we should be answering aggressively um, to see whether or not there's an additional benefit from nature here we can think about in bringing nature into a really core component of daily lives for so many people. So I've given you a suggestion that we can start to think about nature functionally as adding value to our water supply systems and to education. There's additional research and growing interest in other areas as well, suggesting nature in agricultural production systems increases production, that nature can improve health in cities, and even in the work environment, right here in places like the building we're in. And these suggest that there really is some potential to think about nature as normal, as a common and core part of our daily lives, and that we do depend on the benefits that we get from nature in many, many ways beyond having great places to recreate and go on vacation, which are critical and important, but maybe just the, the first step in the ways that nature really impacts our, our core existence. So I want to end by saying I'm, I'm excited to hear the rest of the conversations today, and I want to come back to one thing that Secretary Salazar said, which is that anyone in this business knows that the first question you always get is, why, we should, why should we spend our money outdoors? We have all these other key problems. And the point I want to make is that increasingly, those problems are connected, and the outdoors coming closer to our daily lives looks like a real solution to things from drinking water supplies to education to health. And so Colorado the Beautiful really may be the same thing as Colorado the Smart and Colorado the Healthy. Thank you. <laughs>